Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a great guest that I think you're really going to enjoy. So the new Dune movie is out. I am a massive Dune fan. I've read pretty much all the books, especially all the terrible ones. It's a it's a universe that I've always loved. I've always been fascinated by. The, the later books get pretty bad, but the early ones have a lot of very thoughtful commentary about all kinds of things, sociology, ecology, mankind. It, it's it's very interesting. It's a, it's a deep book. It's it's the next step beyond Star Wars a lot of people take as kind of young men when they're reading science fiction. And I think that's why it's often so well loved in circles like ours. And it's really interesting that these new movies came out because many people look at Dune, I think, correctly as a very difficult film or a book to film. And so there's a lot of questions of whether you can make a good movie about it, what what's going to be left in those kind of things. I was a fan of the first movie, but the second movie, I think, leaves something to be desired. I wanted to talk about several things about this movie. And of course, the best person to talk about Dune with is Morgoth. Morgoth, thank you for coming on, man. No problem. It's nice to be on the show again, uh, especially, especially to talk about this kind of thing. It's me, one of the favorite subjects of mine. Yeah, same same thing, man. It's you know, it's Spengler or Dune. I, I you know, the, yeah. whenever I'm thinking about these things, I know who I need to talk to. It's definitely a Morgoth. If you for some reason are not watching Morgoth's videos or reading his Substack, make sure to do so. You can try to follow him on Twitter, but he's so ridiculously shadow banned. Like I think I directly entered your name, and even though we follow each other, I don't. I I still wouldn't bring you up. It's amazing. That's that's depressing. I thought I was getting good traction. <laughs> I, I, I thought I was getting good numbers. I'm so uh, sorry, man. I just, uh, yeah, it, I it, in spite of your shadow band, that's how good you are. That you yeah, know, well, you break yeah. it through. I mean, it's funny enough. Uh, Spang, there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities and crossover. I think with with Spangler's view of history and Frank Herbert's Dune, which is probably why it sort of uh, it's it slots together in my mind a bit as well. Absolutely. Yeah. One of one of the better statements about Dune I'd ever heard was was from Dave, the distributist, uh, who was on our stream last time we talked about Dune. Uh, but but Dune is a book about time in many ways. And I think that's that's one of the reasons that you can feel those echoes of Spangler in those. The cycle of civilization is certainly something that you see across multiple books if you read beyond just the first book in the series. But we're going to get into the movie we're going to talk about what we liked what we didn't like well this will this will serve as both a review and as uh you know a, a delving into deeper themes so if you haven't seen the movie and for, or for some reason you haven't read dune from forever ago you spoilers i guess but before we dive into all that guys i need to tell you about your absolute moral duty to hire based people through companies like new founding Hey guys, I need to tell you about today's sponsor, New Founding Talent. Look, we all know that the job market is a disaster right now. Based people can't find good companies to work for, and good companies can't find anybody to get the job done. The competency crisis is very, very real. So how do we get these two incredibly important groups together? We need organizations like New Founding. New Founding has created a network of high-excellence professionals who are seeking to join grounded American businesses. These are individuals, often in elite organizations, who are ready for a team and a mission that supports their values instead of working against them. Aligned companies are already using this network to hire high-trust, exceptional individuals who can match the culture and mission of their teams. So if you're looking for better employees to build a better world, you need to go ahead and apply for access to the New Founding Talent Network at newfounding.com backslash talent. You'll get connected with candidates who will build your business. That's newfounding.com backslash talent. Check it out today. All right, Morgoth. So I want to use the classic, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly format for this kind of review. Start with the things that we like that were positive, then to things that were not so great, and then things that were a disaster. But before we get into the details, what was your overall impression? I think from the title of the stream, people might be able to tell mine. But but what was your feeling about the movie? I thought there was a um, there was lots of I thought the action actual action sequences. I felt like I'd seen it all before, where there's just like sort of thousands of men running running at each other. I think that was sort of maxed out in in the Lord of the Rings era, and then immediately after. And so now you think, yeah, 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 I get it. it. It's lots of CGI, huge armies. We, we've done it before, and then there's going to be like generic battle sequences. 
But then when you touch on something which is more specific to June, like blowing up the the, the mine harvest, the spice harvester uh, machines and this kind of thing, it, it, then it comes into its own a bit. Then you think, okay, now now I can say, well, this is specific to June. This is in the June world. And to be honest, I, I, even in the, the first film, I actually really enjoyed the aesthetics of this. It genuinely feels alien, but at the same time, human. I think so, a lot of science fiction can come across as being awful, um, but June has the advantage because they can dress people up in more traditionalist uh, sort of garb, which feels more human and rooted in a history. Whereas in something like Star Trek, when they're running around with those uniforms on, it, it always, I don't know, I don't, I don't like that. Um, and, and for a particular, on the, the subject of set pieces, I loved the sequence where Paul mounted the worm for the, the first time. I thought that was just spectacularly done. Um, the, the little touches, the, 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 the music was grating for most of the time, but on that one, it, they kind of got it just right. Um, I thought the build-up to the, the, the sequence was great. And then even, you know, when he's he's got his grappling hooks and he's getting lashed all over by the sand, and then when he gradually begins to get to his feet and you see that his legs are wobbling with the just the immensity of it all, and then he actually stands up proper and he's done it. And so you had this uh, sort of a trial um, where he got the payoff and he did it and it didn't come easy. And that's that's the kind of thing that I like. That's the kind of thing that I like to see in June, where too often now, I mean, we'll get on to girl bosses later, I'm sure of it, but we've become kind of accustomed where everybody gets something for free and they don't suffer for it. And that's never that's never been what June is. You suffer the the characters in June suffer a lot, um, and I think it came across so well in the in the, in the worm mounting sequence. And then I mean. I think um, the the actual sort of end battle it seemed to be all over quite quite quickly, quite abruptly. And that, that that that's kind of true to the book and to the David Lynch novel, but uh, and I felt I feel as if they did that on purpose because they're setting it up for June Messiah to be in the next in the franchise. But uh, overall, I, I didn't hate the movie. Um, I didn't. There was people in my replies before when we when we were uh, sort of pitching the stream, saying, "Come on, it wasn't that bad." No, it, it wasn't that bad. But I mean, Dave Cullen said on Computing Forever, like, "Is is it getting the pass because there's so much rubbish out there? Like, how would this stand up if it came out in say?" 1999 or 2001 or something so that that's that's interesting to, to consider as well that's a gen me general ass assessment of the movie though yeah i feel in a similar way it, it, it's too much to say that it's a bad movie i don't think it's a bad movie and actually if i had never read the book if i just if i was just a random guy off the street who had seen dune part one and walked in and watched dune part two i would say that was a good movie like that. That was a strong movie. It has the advantage, like you said, of being surrounded by very bad movies. This is way better than any Marvel garbage. This is way better than anything we're getting out of Disney with Star Wars or whatever. So it, it's not a high bar, but it's clearing that bar. So is it better than most things in the movie theater today? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I saw it on IMAX. I think that was well worth it. It's a beautifully shot film. I agree with you that the aesthetics are one of the key things that uh, Villeneuve really gets down. Uh, it, he communicates visually uh, a universe that is not Star Wars, which is really important. I think that you're right to say that Star Wars and Star Trek are very much their own thing, and their visual language has invaded almost everything science fiction at this point, even things that aren't directly science fiction, like Marvel movies that, that kind of brush up against it. And so there it's so you're so used to that visual language being universal that when we see something like Dune, it truly feels alien while also feeling more human somehow. And the way that he communicates that is really important. Like you said, the the battles where they're just running at each other does nothing for me. But those specific scenes, like when they're shooting the the Orenthopters with the uh, with the bazooka and they're trying to get through the shield and everything like that was a really great scene. The worm scene was a really great scene. So it's not that the movie is a complete disaster. It's not that there's there's nothing redeeming about it. I would agree that 
in general, it's it's probably better than most of what you're seeing. However, uh, it has some really critical flaws. And I think the flaws are important, not just because, oh, the my movie wasn't just like my book and now I'm angry. It's that the the things that couldn't be communicated in the movie uh, are there or aren't communicated just because, oh, well, we didn't have enough time on the screen or something or there's a technical limitation. It's because our culture can't handle a lot of those things. I think characters like Cheney were critically changed. I think that the the interactions between uh, the, the you know the idea of the religious interactions and things these things were critically changed because I don't think the director or, or the you know the people who are funding the making the movie really could tell those parts of the story because they've completely lost that connection. I mean, Dune is a book written in the '60s, and it feels like in you know what isn't that long ago. You know, where it's very not that great of a span of time. We've completely lost the ability to explore some of those themes. And so they just had to cut them down or cut them completely out in order to make it so an audience with modern tastes would have an ability to follow what was going on. Yeah, I think they were also uncomfortable with the the, the, the family elements of it. Like um, in, the, in the book, uh, Paul and uh, Shani actually have a child who dies. There's no, I mean, the, and, and the time scale is all truncated down to what seems like just a few weeks. I mean, even the um, the, weir the weirdest thing I thought was that Jessica doesn't even give birth to Alia. And, and, and this, if so in the way that it works the, the, for the Bene Gesserit, is that the consciousness of the past is passed down through the female line. Um, and so Je Jessica, Alia, will have that. But it, what she, in, in actual fact, she's... Uh, comes out where she's like a three or a four year old little girl but she has the knowledge and awareness of like a senior sort of Benny Gesserit uh, reverend mother who's like 60s or 70 years old so it comes across as this really odd creepy scary little child who isn't quite a child and in the film Jessica was walking around talking to her womb um, and absorbing the knowledge from her womb, which which I thought, like, give it, giving the sort of the progressive ideas that they sprinkled in there, that's kind of a weird way to go with that because it opens up interesting questions about the, the pro-choice debate and abortion. Like, if you're walking around talking, <laughs> it's, it's just, I just thought, what, what do they think of that? And so, yeah, I thought I thought that was kind of strange. And because Alia isn't even born, it had consequences at the end with Baron Harkonnen and, and and all of these things. And you got the you got the feeling that it was a stupid move because they could have done it where it just flashed up on the screen like eighteen months or two years later or something like that. And they didn't even do it. But I think for whatever reason, uh, they just weren't comfortable with the religious aspects the more esoteric aspects, but also just children and family as well. Yeah, which is really interesting. I guess let's let's start there with the things that didn't work because I think that that is probably my central complaint about what hap what happens in this movie. Obviously, if you you know, the, the one of the biggest changes is girl boss Cheney, right? We have Zendaya. Uh, lo a lot of questions about her casting in general, but specifically, uh, this is a character that has to be you know, strong and powerful and has to be her own woman because that's the only way we know how to write this kind of stuff. And of course that character in the novel is very strong. She, she's a, she's a fighter. All of the Fremen have to be, you know, the, the way that the, the tribe is set up, that's just a necessity of people in this kind of harsh condition. But in the book, it's never assumed like it is today that a woman being strong or a woman even being a combatant means that she wouldn't be a mother, that she wouldn't be a loyal wife, that she wouldn't support a, her husband and you know, also assume the feminine roles that are attached to that. But of course, a modern audience can't look at someone like Zendaya and say, oh, well, she's going to back Paul. And so they critically change her character. She, in the book, is someone who is one of the deepest believers in Paul and his mission. And even though she believes in him, she also serves an incredibly important purpose of keeping him grounded throughout the entire story because she's still kind of the the home the, the the personal place the set apart from the larger mission she sees who he is and who he's becoming but she still cares about him individually 
And that has a really powerful impact because, of course, like you said, they end up having a child. And so when Siege Tabar is killed in or destroyed in the book, it really matters because their child is murder in that. It's a it has a lot of impact in the movie. They reference it for like four seconds. You're like, what is happening? The siege got blown up. OK, no one cares. No one of consequence dies. It has no it, you should completely rob it because you had to remove that impact because you can't have her having children because well, you know, she has to show up as a hard bitten Fedaikin in the last uh, battle. And so she can't have, she can't be a mom at the same time. She also loses all the important interactions with, cha- with, uh, w- uh, with Paul's mother because they're both having children, you know, more or less simultaneously or, or very close to each other. They're, they're sharing that kind of bond in some ways, even though it's, it's awkward and others that interplay. And finally, if Cheney's not with Paul, if they're, you know, at the end of the movie, then how do you get Dune Messiah and Children of Dune? <laughs> like the whole the whole point of those sequels is that Cheney feels the loss of the first child. She's unable to bear him an heir, which puts a lot of pressure on his eventual uh, you know marriage to Princess Irlan to go ahead and possibly have a child then. And she goes through this whole spice ritual to to kind of uh, make sure she has to have these children. Like all of that is critical to the storyline and you've removed all of it because you had to remove the family and, and the wife aspect of Cheney's character. You strip her of, of basically everything that makes her a likable person and a critical part to Paul's journey. Yeah, they also changed the character of Lee Kynes to a black woman. And and here again, you like they've switched it so that she then was uh involved or we it's kind of hinted at that she had a relationship with a fremen but in in the book it's a much it's much more embedded and uh, within the fremen as a family there's children and there's relationships involved all over the place and so all all of this it's like it's like the, the director just w- didn't want to have all of these connections. So you get the impression that people just jump out of the ground. They don't have children, which which is which is is, is like a major a major point to 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 June. And another on on the point of Changi as well is that she actually turns into a kind of Richard Dawkins new atheist type, where it's it's she starts to criticize the religious aspects and steps completely outside of that frame going on about how it's all this sort of control mechanism and it's going to be oppressive and all of this kind of thing uh, as, as, if, as if like it, it's as if they needed a, a kind of progressive counterpoint to some of the like the raw reactionary elements within june and it's as if they were workshopping it somewhere and they were like well look this is going too far like okay we've got the diversity that we need in there but it's more than that. It's the actual raw content uh, of of the world itself is is problematic. So we need a, a critical voice in there. We need we need somebody who's thinking critically and can ask questions and all of this kind of thing. And so they they did that in, instead of actually having a senior figure, uh, somebody in in a, in a place of responsibility of power doing that the act which i think would have been more skillful because it would question the world more they actually sort of did it all under they handed it all to shani yeah the the way that the religion thing was handled was just terrible all over the place it's interesting you know my wife had not read dune before we got married and so she ended up reading it because of how much i liked it and she ended up watching the movies and things and you know when she's going through it she says i don't think i like paul And I'm like, yes, exactly. Because part of the journey is Paul is not Luke Skywalker. The journey Paul is on is a very different journey. Paul is becoming this religious leader. He's embodying his own myth. And as that happens, he does things and takes attitudes that aren't probably something that the average modern person would be comfortable with. And that's part of the story is that actually the, you know, the, the, the destiny, uh, the prophecy, uh, the the religious fervor it is a commentary on those things but it's a far deeper commentary because you have to build over that time where paul works with the you know teaches the fremen the weirding way which is the actual reason they care about him in the first place and in his mother they don't talk talk, talk about that at all in the movie and the fact that he builds the fadaiken and they you know they kind of build this the slow 
religious cult around him in the movie it's just turned into this binary decision of well if you go south to where the fanatics are uh that's where the religious fanatics are yeah really subtle by the way guys that's <laughs> but we, you go south yeah. and that's where the religious, <laughs> religious fanatics are and once you cross that line you 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 can't come back and i think it's a it's hard because i don't think a lot of directors know how to actually write a character like that or how to portray a character like that uh, because they don't they don't know how to develop it. So you have this guy and he's on the hero's journey and you just need like this moment where basically he does a heel turn and become and he like embodies this religious zealotry instead of being able to build up this, you know, this uh, thing that's happening over time, this religious movement that's building around him, because that's the only way they can understand it. Paul was a good guy. And then he flipped the switch and activated the dumb religious people. And now he's evil. They, they, there's no way that they're able to build that nuance because they themselves don't understand it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and they they injected that north south in like that's new as well. Where yep. the people the people of the north, uh, presumably, that they they are more liberal. Basically, there's no other way to put it to get to it. And the people of the south are more fanatical, more religious extremists. It's yeah, it's it's right that you pick it up on. You see it, you see it in the the ethnic makeup as well. Where when when I knew, when I heard they were going to do the June. I knew uh, what they would do with the Fremen because from the perspective of uh, today's Hollywood, I thought that's such low-hanging fruit because it does lean into the desert and Islam uh, and the, it's got these themes in it. And so that that's kind of coded as to be uh, non-Western. And so they, they I knew that's the direction they would go in. Um, but I was actually surprised at how far in the other direction they went for the Harkonnen where it's like Finns and uh, a, a Swede and a, a Greek and, and all all they're all like ethnically European white, and they are all of course uh, the bad guys, and and it's it's kind of sad because you you think yeah like where 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 we are the we are the mid century Germans again it's it's it you, there's no getting away from it you, there's no way you can get around that even if you think the cinematography was excellent it, it will always come down to that. Um, and it, it does affect your viewing, and and it's kind of like I think this June there's a temptation to kind of say like it is a, a discussion to have because it, it is it, for them to cast the Fremen as being very diverse was very low hanging fruit for Hollywood, um, but then it's it's like well do I just live with it and then well if I live with it it's 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 like. I, I'm kind of selling out. Like I know what they're doing here, and shall I just go around anyway with it? Like, will will I just sort of absorb it and and step over it? But then when you see like just the the scale of the difference between the Harkonnens, um, I, I, and the, and the Fremen, it it did kind of rankle because I thought, well, yeah, we are the bad guys again. Yeah, when you have you know. Okay, so the desert Islam, they're North African. Okay, you can kind of see, you know, they're going to do this anyway. So at least it's somewhat logical. And you think, well, surely they could just stop themselves there, right? Like that'll be sufficient. But you're right. The, the problem with this stuff is it never stops. And that's the thing is even when you think like, oh, well, okay, I can see how you get two and two there. And that gets you to four. And we know there's going to be some degree of this. And so surely that'll be enough. But e even when it comes to the, you know, the the, the different ways that they go ahead and code the the villains and the heroes it, it can't even stop there we have to inject new atheism we have to inject this weird uh kind of uh sub uh you know american geographical uh you know dig in here like it just they it never just stops at that one change and, and that's always the problem it's always going to bleed deeper i want to get more into the harkonnens i thought that was also a a, a kind of failure there as well uh, i want to go ahead and get to alias because uh I, I think that's another big change but before we get to all that guys let's go ahead and hear from new founding venture hey guys i need to tell you about new founding venture fund look we all know that the current system the current companies out there the current institutions they're old sick dying they're sclerotic they're lame they can't produce anything of value and that means that young talented innovative people are trying to break out break free 
That's bad news for the establishment, but it's good news for us because that means those people are going to go out and found new companies, create new technologies and figure out a way forward for our country. If you're interested in being a part of that exciting new future, then you need to check out the Venture Fund. New Founding has rallied the founders who have massive visions for a better future and is investing in these companies through its Venture Fund. The companies they invest in are defined by a simple question. Does the country we want to live in need the company this person is building? Look, venture investing isn't for everyone. But if you're a serious accredited investor who wants to see a more hopeful future for this country, go to newfounding.com slash venture fund and apply to be an investor. Again, that's newfounding.com slash venture fund. All right. So like I said, the Harkonnens were another disappointment for me. This is a villain that is always over the top, right? They're always very theatrical. That's part of it. So I expect that there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but obviously the way that they uh, portrayed them and particularly how dumb they seem to be in the second movie, in the first movie, the Baron, you know, sitting there explaining his plan slowly to the Duke who is paralyzed. Like the, that is a, really interesting scene that's a very you know it's a terrifying villain that communicates the the menace but also uh how scheming and plotting and and kind of nefarious uh the harkonnens are and so i think they're pretty well portrayed in the first movie in the second movie they're just dumb like they're just really stupid in the books raban is a is a ploy he's used as a cudgel to go ahead and break the fremen open to go ahead and shatter uh, the resistance in Dune, and then Fade is supposed to come in and be the, the charming guy who saves everyone from Raban. That his bad governance is is actually part of the Baron's larger plan to set up his own uh, heir, you know, his chosen heir, the the real heir to the throne. And in the movie, they're just they're just bad. Like the 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 Harkonnens are just bad at what they do. Uh, they're messy. Uh, they're they're all of their plans are really dumb and obvious. None of it works. It, it just feels like they're no time was spent in making these guys interesting in the slightest. No, the, the, like if you were the emperor, you'd never put these guys in charge of Arrakis, like never because they're completely incompetent and stupid. <laughs> and, and in like in the book and even in the original David Lynch movie, Baron Harkonnen was, was ridiculous, but there was a, he does have his own, I, I, I hesitate to say charm, but he does have something about him. He taught Firstly, he has a lot more lines. He talks a lot, and he's all about plans within plans and schemes within schemes. Um, and he's a very entertaining character. I remember the first time I read the book, I was even skipping back and reading his, his lines again because I thought it was it was so uh, interesting. And you get the impression here that it's kind of like he got the look. Well, this is going to be, he's going to look cool when he's coming out of that oil bath thing. And then when he's fat and is floating and we've got, we've got the aesthetics, right? Raban is that huge actor who pops up uh, these days. So we've, we've got all of that, right. And we just don't really need to flesh out the characters. They don't need have to have characters. They're just bad. And then that's the end of it. Um, I mean, I know it's fashionable to sort of everybody to slag off game of Thrones, but the characters in that, I mean, even late stage, even the final season of Game of Thrones, which everybody complains about, had better written characters than what the Harkonnens are in, in this June movie. Yeah, absolutely. And so the next part, I would say I, another disappointment would be Alia, like we kind of mentioned earlier. You understand to some degree why that character is hard to communicate. Obviously, uh, putting you know, child actors are... Uh, notoriously difficult especially one that would have to be as young as her but she is a, a critical part of the story like you said the pre-born uh the pre-born nature of her explains a lot of what paul's going through and i think that was another thing that was really not explained at all the quizlux hatterack is not explained what what why is that significant and i think it's not explained because the whole point of that is that paul is a man doing what the Bene Gesserit usually do and the fact that a man could finally do this meant that he could immediately go beyond what a woman could do. And that is just something Hollywood is just not going to put on film. And so they basically just throw this term out there, but they never explain it. They don't explain what's going on. You don't know what this transformation means. You don't know why he actually needs to drink the water of life. You don't understand like basically any of this. Like you said, the genetic memories 
that happen only to a reverend mother. They don't happen to your average Benny Jesuit. But if the reverend mothers go ahead and take, you know, go through the trial, then they get access to all of these previous lives. And that ability gives them just a vast amount of knowledge, uh, all these skills, uh, uh, an incredible continuity, and all these consciousnesses kind of join them. And that happening to Alia so young is a critical part of the next couple of movies because it because it's never supposed to happen to a child and that ends up driving her insane. That's a that's a, a critical part of what happens next. But it also uh, is a critical part of what happens to Paul because he gets access to these memories in a way that was never supposed to happen to a man. And when he does that, he becomes not just the Quizlex Hatterack, but becomes more. The whole reason that Paul is dangerous is that he's not just the Quizlex Hatterack, that he goes ahead and uh, goes to the place that they are not able to go. He ha- he is able to go far beyond those abilities. Part of that is also his Mentat training, which they don't touch on at all. And so there's just a lot of that is left out, I think specifically because you can't have the scene where he just yells at them like, woman, you don't understand what I can see now because I have ascended to a level that you can, you are not capable of. Yeah, I've, I've, the Mentats are hardly in it at all. It's basically some we had fat man who blinks uh, for yeah. a few now and then at the beginning, but you, you not, it's not explained. And I think from, I mean, to be kind, I think from the writing perspective, cause they didn't, I mean, I did a video on the Butleri and Jihad and stuff uh, last year. And I think they were thinking, well, yeah, the, we, if we start to tug on the fact that they've got what amount of human computers, we're going to have to like go off on another tangent about why they don't have computers and and where and and it's like well yeah let's just sort of make him stand there and blink a little bit, uh, and we we'll, we'll just we'll just not really explain what the mentats are why why there is this pressure um, on the civilization to produce a replacement for computers or why even the Benny Jesuits are around and all of this kind of thing, I mean I do think though that the the timing you know you get these big. Uh, m- movies dropping into the cultural discourse, and I do find the timing of June uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm not suggesting that there was anything was planned or some kind of, you know, there was some kind of Benny Gesserit style conspiracy going on with Hollywood or whatever. But when you, it's it's like it, it reflects quite well the sort of the the way woke connects with this emerging third worldism and this the fact that the western empire is fraying at the edges and you're seeing rebellions i mean literally the islamic rebellions and if you take in the the palestine situation you've got the ukraine war you've got tensions going on all over the place and it's as if it's as if we are in this empire and it's kind of beating off this kind of high energy resistance so it's fraying at the edges and June leans into that uh, very well. And I was doing a little bit of snooping on uh, YouTube today just to sort of see what people were picking up on, to see if they were getting into this. And there is there is videos uh, about that quite a bit. And I think it's interesting because it, it puts us in a strange position because, once again, you're going to have the, the sort of the progressive left uh, feeling an affinity for the Fremen and for the... The kind of the the, the jihad essentially um, against against this sort of spiritualist sort of technocracy, and then we uh, in 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 the DR kind of find ourselves entombed with this. Where what what? Funny enough, I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago called "The Online Rights Kobayashi Maru Test," where how do we actually deal with these emerging trends? Where Where is our place and all of this? Because it seems whichever way we turn, we, we, we don't want to side with the regime that hates us. On the other hand, you don't want to side with the enemies of Western civilization. And I actually think it's quite interesting that June emerged, uh, it, it like kind of landed in the discourse as we have all of these things going on. And you see this kind of, it, it's laced with the cultural zeitgeist and with, with with what we think of as sort of woke intrusion into Hollywood as well, especially with the, the Shani character, um, and then and then the wider arc of it is uh, of the June. I mean, what we've got, it's like, what do we do? Do you defend the empire, or, or it's it's a, it's a it's a difficult situation that I find that we're in. 
Yeah, that's true. It, it is that this is the problem when the institutions that you know that are supposed to hold up your own civilization betray you, right? Like the 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 average person can no longer trust the the very structures that were designed to hold their civilization aloft. But you also can't sign with the people who are trying to crush your own civilization. You know, this is always the weird thing. For instance, yeah, I, I read people like Alexander Dugan and people say, oh, well, you're a Duganist. And like, no, I, I know Dugan hates me and wants me dead. But some of his critiques are interesting. Some of them matter. And so I read what I think is useful and I leave the rest. And I think that's often the situation where we're in, you know, that we just we we look at these things and we realize that they're real sicknesses going through our own civilization. We recognize many of the criticisms from outside that civilization have some level of validity or we wouldn't be in the position where we're in. We also realize the people bringing them really do hate us or wish, uh, wish us ill simultaneously. I just had Glenn Greenwald jump in my mentions on Twitter about this basically, where I was like, well, you know, if you import a large amount of people, you're going to end up with their very conflicts. So you can't be surprised when say, you know, pro-Palestinian groups start tearing down, you know, things in Cambridge. And it's like, well, you know, it's 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 all these people in your own civilization that are pushing for it too. I'm like, yeah, I understand. Like, I'm I'm fully aware of the level of the problem that we we really are stuck, uh, you know, between this. That doesn't mean make my point less valid, but yeah, I, I get you how how kind of stuck we are. Um, yeah, and we're seeing these uh, lots of talk of conscription and lots of talk of. Did, did, did what amounts to like we we need our own Sauduka. Uh, we need our own sort of elite troops, and you're gonna have to do it. And you think, well, yeah, but what's in it for us? Like you hate us. You, you actually actively side with the people who are tearing down works of art and tearing down statues, like launching hate campaigns on the native local populations. And so, on the one hand, we find ourselves both as the Fremen, as a kind of uh, oppressed people, but then also being at the heart of the empire as well. And of course, I, I thought it was interesting that this time there's no ambiguity about which side the, the, the Putin, unlike Starship Troopers, like they, 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 they left instinctually knew that they would side with the Fremen and their culture wars. They, they both, it, madly, again, like they, they would end up back, back in galactic jihad to take down the empire, not understanding that there's not much of a future in that for them themselves. Um, and and we, we are kind of stuck in the middle trying to find a frame of reference or so, some kind of north or south to find a, in, the, in this whole mess. What do you think that means for the franchise then? Are we in a, you know, one of the criticisms that I think Dave, the distributors, and I believe you also kind of leveled at uh, Game of Thrones is they simply couldn't finish that story. It's unfinishable because of kind of the times we live in, our attitudes towards these things is simply, there's no catharsis. There's no end to that story because we've lost our ability to actually explore those themes when they've stripped out all of these aspects of Dune, you know, you can go ahead and push, I guess, like you said, the third worldism aspect, you know, make it the struggle of, of kind of the outsiders, the, the tribes against the empire. You can kind of push that aspect, but we've already seen them strip out the family, the strip out the, the, the any of the complexity in the religion. These are all things that are critical to in the next parts of this uh, storyline. Is there a way to continue this? Is it dead on arrival? I mean, this movie did very well at the box office, so I feel like they're going to make another one. I don't think there's any way they have the self-restraint to, to recognize that they've kind of hung themselves narratively. Is there anywhere this can go? Yeah, I mean, the, so the problem, they, if you think of the, the problem that they had with the show of the Game of Thrones, that they couldn't really get a cathartic ending. In, in June, it only ever gets more reactionary and more right-wing as they go in. I mean, the next book's literally called June Messiah. And it's hard to wire that up. Like, there's, there's going to be a crossing point where Western progressives realize, hey, wait a moment, this isn't actually, you bring down the empire, it doesn't actually mean we're heading into, uh, like, race communism or Star Trek world. There's actually a legitimate religious fundamentalist <laughs> movement here and it's going to kill us if we don't go along with it and we're, we're like that's that so there's not really a progressive future unless they just completely betray the source material 
um, as as they, as they have done on, on other things. But that, then you get you're going to slide into the the sort of the culture war things, which tore apart the Star Wars fan and the the Tolkien one with the Amazon show, which was another bastardization of the source material. And you feel as if they've painted themselves in the corner um, on how to get out of this. And it, it seems like somehow it's going to be Shani who, who is somehow going to carry the, the torch of progressivism as galactic jihad sets the, the galaxy aflame and billions of people die or something. But I, yeah, I, I don't know. But I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, you definitely feel like Dune Messiah is going to turn into a battle between her and Paul, right? Like, that's got to be the the way that they're going to approach that. He completely embraces his galactic jihad, and she stays true to the, I don't know, atheist <laughs> tribal leaders. I guess I don't. It's a very strange. I, I don't I don't understand it. I hear there's also supposed to be a Bene Gesserit uh, show that's going to come out. Uh, which, you know, makes sense in some ways. There's a lot of extra stories to tell there, but also you can see that the the focus is let's get this thing as female-centric as possible right away. Though, to be fair, I think to some extent that was always true of Dune, especially the later novels in uh, that, that Frank Herbert wrote uh, basically are novels about, uh, about the Bene Gesserit, not about, you know, even the continuation of the Atreides family at some point. Yeah, I mean, even even in the the, the Butlerian Jihad, um, when that so that's in the era, um, the first book, when humanity is is literally enslaved. There's only like three planets left or something. They're, they are humanity is right on the edge of extinction, at the hands of the machines. And then there's a, a what the, a few, there's a couple of women. This the Benny Jesuit don't actually exist yet. This is how they kind of come along. Um, and there's a, a couple of women with psychic powers realize that they, they, you can't beat the, the AI and the robots with weapons. They, they've got too much firepower. You can't hit them like that. But what it is is that the a lot of these kind of tech bro transhumanists from, from more or less our age have got their brains in these com in these robot suits and they live forever. And the these women kind of figure out that if they concentrate energy, they can squish their brains and kill them that way inside their suits. So this becomes a game changer, uh, and they, they just don't stop. They they they, clean, they utterly purge the galaxy of, of AI. So and 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 this is the this is what becomes the Benny Jesuit Sisterhood. So I'm actually fine. I'm actually fine with the focus on that because because the rules are kind of set. I'm fine with the fact that men make better mentats than, and they just can't have any kind of powers uh, as the Bene Gesserit sisterhood. It's when they start mixing all of that up that it all turns into this kind of grey gloop. I mean, you know, <laughs> back in the real world, progressives are going to have an issue with that because they actually find it difficult to define what a woman even is. So there's a clear, there's a clear difference. Uh, there's lines that you can't cross, which are concrete. And absolute and Frank Herbert, which uh, real world progressives don't even have that to fall back on. So they may find that it's too it's too female centric, it's too cis centric, or something. They'll find something to moan about if they, even if you did have, even if they were trying to kind of think, well, let's have a really you know epic sci-fi. It'll be all female and everything. You could actually pull that off, but that it's like it's not going to go down well with the people that they're directing it at. Yeah, again, it feels like they've stripped out all of the elements that make the characters distinct. And so therefore, like you said, eventually it all just has to collapse back into the gray goo. You can't actually communicate, uh, you know, a female, even an actually strong female like Chaney is in the book, because, well, she's still too feminine. At the end of the day, she's still a mother. She still has the impulses of a wife. She has the impulses of a mother. She still takes on those roles. And we just can't depict those in any way. There's just no way that we're allowing a young, you know, uh, starlet that is now getting all these roles to be portrayed as anything other than the master of her own destiny, rebelling against every kind of, you know, uh, stability, any kind, any kind of system around her. That's just the only way that they know how to write any of this. And so you, you can't explore even the more feminine aspects of the Bene Gesserit because those are dangerous, in, un, dangerous in and of themselves, simply acknowledging 
that they exist and that this is a role that women play in society and a critical role. I mean, you know, it, it's it's not super subtle, but it, it is it is interesting that Frank Hubbard just directly says, oh, well, women are the are the actual selectors of breed, breeding. They are the selection factor when it comes to what genes spread. I'm just going to make that the entire theme of the Bene Gesserit. I'm just going to build that as to be you know, their entire identity is what's what's the job of the <laughs> female centered uh, group? Well, their job is literally to select who gets to breed and what that ends up creating. Yeah, it, it, it's one of the another aspect which was played down is the a sort of planning um, and a deterministic view of history. The, the, this is also a dialed right back w w of prophecies and destinies and and a history just sort of the, the Spenglerian sort of thing where you you can't actually you, it's limited and 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 whether you can change history or whether it is destiny is up for grabs that that is sort of a tension point in there but all of these things of course that has for everybody for especially for women for minorities, for everybody that has to be open ended, you will you will have complete freedom, um, and nothing will nothing will be written, as they say in in Lawrence of Arabia, uh, which which has obviously got some similarities with June. Yeah, again, that's the whole point of Paul is the as the Quizlet Hatterack, and that's also how he fails in the later novels. He refuses to embrace his destiny to break humans out of this almost Spenglerian cycle, right? That's the, the stiltifying uh, imperial setting, the, the way that everything is locked in uh, because they have to avoid the development of, of computers or anything else, the, all the things that humanity has to be because it doesn't have access to these machines and it can't develop technologically in specific directions. Th those all lock him in, into a particular type of life, a particular way of being. And that's part of the story is that Paul... Uh, you know, he's supposed to just be this perfect weapon of the Bene Gesserit, but he actually breaks out of that because he's he's born when he's not supposed to be. He's male when he's supposed to be female, and and he reaches a, a level of understanding that they they don't have. But he also ends up rejecting the golden path. He ends up rejecting the the path that will actually free humanity from this future. And his son Leto ends up having to be the one that embraces it. And that's where you get one of the more interesting books in the series, I think which is God Emperor of Dune. And I don't think they can ever make that book for a lot of reasons. Uh, but, uh, but one of the reasons is again, the themes like you have to re-savage as a people to survive, right? That's, that's one of the themes of that book is you can become too uh, civilized. You can lose your ability to, you know, uh, to protect yourself and perpetuate yourself. And again, if that doesn't feed into the condition the West is in right now, then I don't know what does. Yeah, I mean, I would like to. I would like to see some videos by progressives where they weren't. I think. I think one of the issues with June in general, when it comes out like this, is that I actually doubt many of them probably read the books, and they'll go. What? What are they? The, the media literacy and all this kind of thing, and and they'll be looking for gotchas. So they in in a kind of progressive uh, the, the the culture war thing, they they will see people on right wing Twitter. <clears throat> Um, making memes about Zendaya and that saying she's not particularly nice to look at, and they will take the bait on these kinds of things. And and th this is this is this is kind of what I wanted to avoid because I do think it's kind of it's missing a lot of interesting aspects to June. What I would like to see would be video essays addressing head on the fact that they're staring thousands of years in the future. And the high technology sort of society is dust. It's long gone. The future belongs, the, the, the far future belongs to neo feudalism and religious zealots. That, mm -hmm. That's what I'd like to see them address. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that would, if they were actually interested in a dialogue, if they were really engaging in, in the exploration of ideas, that's exactly where you would go. Because why the, the whole point of this book is to, is to show. Like you said, the limitations of mankind, and, and, and the pre pre precisely because their own worldview, their own philosophy, made that happen. For mm. well, there was a, a one um, interesting video essayist was comparing that I watched was comparing the Dune and, and Star Trek, which is you know it's it's it, they're, they're opposites, but if you take that replicator thing they have on Star Trek, where you can just like 
the computer will create you the best glass of wine in the world, the best steak, all of this. There's there's no constraints. And so this this fellow was pointing out, like, do you really think? And then Picard, somebody asks Picard, like, what what is it that you do? Like, what is it? And he said, oh, it's self improvement. That's what it's all about. And in actual fact, he wouldn't. You would get the wall E scenario where everybody's just like gigantically obese, sort of floating around on chairs and, and all of this kind of thing. But yet that, that that will be sort of the progressive dream coming to fruition and it's going to lead to complete civilizational collapse or as where kind of June begins a little bit with the, just the machines taking over entirely and the early taking of humanity. So either way, they have to deal with the problem that their own philosophical world world picture is going to make that happen in the long term whether they want it or not yeah you know stephen colbert is obviously like just a, a sad clown uh in a lot of ways uh but he recently said uh he was doing some interview and he's like yeah i'm ready for the ai to take over i'm ready to be ruled by the robots we're, we're no good at this anymore i i'm willing to hand that over and all i could think about is like man there is just nothing new under the sun man their their human nature is so predictable it's terrifying the fact that this just bug man would the the total last man willing to to give the le very last bit of his will over to this you know artificially managed existence because he simply finds it impossible to speak or struggle against you know half of his country who disagrees with him politically it just oh man it, it's gross and it's it's sad, but it's also just uh, it tells you that humanity has always been this weak, I guess. And there's there, it whether it's Dostoevsky or or Herbert or or Stephen Colbert, you, yeah. you can you kind of just and, see this rise up again. And what comes out on the other side of that is religious. The remnants who survive are fighting with knives and the religious zealots. Yep, yeah, the future. Whether they like it or not, the future belongs to those that have that will. Uh, and you can yeah. call it stupid, and you can call it weak, and you can call it, you know, backward or whatever. But uh, you know that that that's what actually makes it through at the other side. Yeah, and, and they they actually bring it into being. They, uh, they relish the thought of it all. But uh, yeah, it's it's it is a cycle. It is a it is a grand tragedy and a bit of a comical farce, to be honest. Yeah, I guess that's why uh, why the guys like us who are who are big Spangler fans are ne never known for our white pills. I guess <laughs> but there's a, there's a kind of yeah, there's a kind of catharsis in in like in knowing in seeing like what what they're doing and how they're bringing about these catastrophic scenarios, and they do it with such hubris and arrogance as well. Not not understanding not understanding like. The biggest Hollywood blockbuster of the year, leaving aside the other quibbles and whatnot, but it's still there. Like this is your future. Your future is like a, a morbidly obese floating baron, people fighting with knives in the desert, and and they're telling you specifically, like you did this. You you're going to bring this on yourselves. But uh, that we're, we're we're in clownland. The the it's for them. It's the equivalent of being deep deep in winter for a modern liberal perspective yeah absolutely all right guys well like i said the movie isn't terrible it, it, it is probably better than most of the things that you would see in a theater so if you want the actual review i would say okay you know again if i had never read the books it, it, i would have probably enjoyed it uh, with no problems uh having read them i enjoyed it somewhat uh so you know if, if that's worth you you go into the movie theater then I, I really don't think it's a terrible movie uh but you know as we've gone on at length i think it does it does have some serious shortcomings especially if you're a fan of the book uh we've got a number of a uh, number of questions from the people here morgoth so before we pivot over to that can you let everybody know where to find your excellent videos and essays uh, morgoth's review on substack uh, morgoth's review on uh, youtube uh, I haven't had a video up for a few weeks, but uh, I, my Substack is is really active. There's one or two articles uh, go up a, a week, and sometimes I do little podcasts on there and things. So yeah, Substack's my main platform. Yeah, you and you and Dave have become more Substackers now, and it's like, man, I, I yeah, I, I I joined this thing to listen to you guys. You know, talk to me. Come on, you're you're killing me here. 
You got to go yeah. out and go and read these things now. But I know uh, a lot of times you can't even get half your stuff on YouTube. So I understand. Let's hear here. Seneca says, all I know about Dune is Warhammer 40K, but it's sitting on my shelf and must read list. So I hope to read it soon. Yeah, cer certainly uh, worth reading. But if you are familiar with 40K, then you will recognize a lot of where those themes came from once you've read Dune. Uh, Creeper Weirdo says, would you guys say that Dune is Star Wars, but for adults or just a more realistic take? Is Dune an accidentally based thing? Well, Dune came out before Star Wars, so it, it influences Star Wars, not the other way around, which I think a lot of people don't realize. And Herbert certainly you know, was a was a hippie to some degree. Like he's always talking about how it's really a book about ecology, which is something we didn't get into, but is an interesting aspect, uh, you know, contrast between like the Harkonnens and the and the Fremen and others, uh, that that's certainly a big part of it. Uh, so there's certainly a a a leftist reading of Dune. Uh, you know, it is ultimately a dances with wolves type tale. Uh, but uh, you know, obviously there are also much deeper by exploring things that you're not really allowed to explore anymore. He still finds some very base things to talk about. Yeah, I mean, you you can actually watch. I mean, as as, a, as an Englishman in England in 2024, I've actually got some sympathy with the with the Indian tribes and dancers of the world. You you can watch dancers with wolves as being quite quite reactionary. That's true. All right, Creeper Weirdo says. Uh, so the stream is about how the director is a douche. Yeah, I, like again, I don't know a whole lot about him. I mean, I liked uh, Blade Runner 2049. Uh, so. Um, uh, you know, I, I've liked at least two of his movies, uh, that in, in Dune Part One, uh, but I don't really know much about him as a person. Super Weirdo says, a uh, game and now a movie is Oren branching out. Well, you know, I try to avoid doing constant news of the gate, news of the day stuff, guys. I mean, I could talk about the State of the Union address yesterday, but who cares, right? <laughs> like, it's who, who cares about Biden's State of the Union at this point? It's just who, who this is a much more interesting thing to talk about. And I, mean, I, oh, sorry, I was go just ahead. gonna, I was just gonna say it quickly as well. I did think Christopher Walken was terribly miscast. I really like Christopher Walken. I've, 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 I can always watch him on screen, but I just expect you always get the sense that he's laughing or being ironic or something like. I expected him to sort of jump up and start dancing or something. Um, and I thought I, I love Christopher Walken, but he, this isn't, this is, he's not an emperor. He's he's like an aging gangster or something, but he's he's not an emperor. Yeah, he, he, I, I agree with the miscasting and the fact that they did not really um, they didn't explore the Padasha Emperor at all was a problem to try to communicate any of that. Like, I think there is a way you could play him as kind of that gangster esque. Where, like, I had to eliminate my rivals. I knew that the you know that that the Atreides yeah. were a danger to myself. Like, you probably could have got him to play that but he was really just like a broken man who was scared from the very beginning and that's just not christopher walken at all it just it communicated yeah. very poorly yeah uh he also says the thing you like is uh woke leftist essay yep for sure all right so uh charlemagne says i recommend uh, i recommend that listeners watch the dune 1984 alternative edition redux on youtube it's a cut of the David Lynch Dune film that is far better than the theatrical cut. Seriously, go watch it. Interesting. Yeah, I've never seen that. Uh, we, I, we didn't get very deep into it, but how do you feel this compares to the David Lynch film? And are you familiar with the sci-fi miniseries at all? Um, I watched one of the early, the June Messiah uh, sci-fi miniseries in the early 2000s. I, I, lo I, lo I love the, the David Lynch Dune. I think I did actually watch the one Charlemagne's talking about. Uh, it was recommended to me, and I think I watched it one night, but I'd have to watch it again. But yeah, yeah, I do, I do like that. And I know it's it's got a bit of eighties cringe to it, and you you get like the the the, the Toto soundtrack and stings in it. But it ha it it has a kind of lightness of touch, and it has a kind of um, it has something. A very 80s vibe, which probably I don't want to be all nostalgic because I get accused of that a lot. But in, in in a way that the new one just doesn't. The new one's super serious. It's very high tech. It's beautiful to look at, but it's it's just a bit like a bit like the Empire itself. It's just lacking soul and spirit. Um, and and I miss the the, the 80s version, e even though like special effects have aged terribly. It's got some cringe dialogue. 
Um, it's, I just feel like it's it's a bit more of an enjoyable watch. And I will say as well, because of the, the way that David Lynch directs, where a lot of it is dream sequences and sort of flights of consciousness, he actually does the religious aspects and the more esoteric stuff very well. It, it, he really works, where you see Paul's consciousness going through space and time. Alia is there as a genuinely creepy little girl. Um, yeah, I, and he's also he's also very comfortable with violence, which so he can bring some of the violence and go out uh, very well. So yeah, I, I like that one. Yeah, I, so I feel like the David Lynch movie is its own thing. Like he understood that he just didn't have time to tell the whole story. He was not going to be able to capture every bit of it. And so he just went ahead and made the best movie he could that referenced the material, even though it changed significant things. It changed, and you know, obviously it's leaving out a lot of themes in, in certain parts. He made it enough of his own to where it didn't feel like it was a, a bastardization of the book because it, it was really doing its own thing in a, in a separate way. The problem with this movie, I think, is that it kind of splits the difference. The the miniseries, the sci-fi miniseries, suffers a lot. Obviously, it's a it's a low budget thing. It's a sci-fi miniseries. Uh, the acting and and the special effects are relatively terrible in in many scenarios. However, the thing that the miniseries has going for it is it's long. It's got I think seven or eight episodes in the in the first miniseries, and then the Children of Dune one is another six or seven or something like that. It collapses Dune Messiah and Children of Dune into into one, and because it has the time, you actually get the feeling that you can actually feel the buildup of the religious fervor. Paul and Cheney have a family, and uh, like there's time for all of this to happen, and so it follows the the books I think fall more closely, and it faithfully recreates more of the themes of the book than either of these movies do. And I think the, you know, the, the Villeneuve films just fall in this awkward middle ground. They, they don't become their own thing uh, and, you know, just kind of shortened up and doing their own thing the way that uh, Fincher's does, but they also try to faithfully recreate parts of the book, but they don't have the time. And they're frankly unable to communicate certain aspects of the book that are now culturally unacceptable and so they don't do as good a job as the miniseries does. So it's just in this weird place where it, it can never successfully be its own thing, but it also can't successfully communicate what the book was trying to do either. Let's see here. Uh, Herlock Sholmes says, which of the Dune books are worth reading and which ones would you recommend skipping? Uh, so for the original, uh, obviously the original Dune trilogy, the, the Dune, Children of Dune, or Dune, Dune Messiah and Children of Doom absolutely must read. I also would put God Emperor of Dune in there as a must read because like I said, it's a very interesting book. It, it really gets to that theme of what happens to a civilization when it becomes too soft. It, it really pays out kind of the Leto uh, taking the golden path. It's very weird. It's a very strange book. That's certainly where uh, Frank Herbert steps into the far weirder books. And then um, Chapter House Dune. And what's the last one that he wrote? I'm trying to remember. Uh, the two after Dune, uh, God Emperor of Dune. Chapter has to do another one. But anyway, those two are definitely very strange. Like uh, they, they discover like space Jews and uh, they discover like uh, sex cultists and all kinds of stuff. It, it, it's definitely, you, you got to be a, a Frank Herbert fan to enjoy those for sure. Uh, I read them all because I've read pretty much all of the Dune books. And then when you go to the the ones that his son started writing uh, with his co-author, I think that um, all of the original house ones are worth reading for sure. The Butlerian Jihad one is worth reading. Uh, and then from there, they really start cranking out the mill of books. They really start getting, uh, you know, you, you can tell it's just like, well, we got to write a book every year. And they, you know, then you really have to be a fan of the Dune universe because they start falling off in quality. But uh, yeah. I don't know if you have any, any opinions there. No, I, I, I would agree. I haven't read as many of the books as you have. I would say stick to the main canon. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we have uh, Sergeant Hodel, which says, Morgoth, do you recommend the prequel books? If so, should the prequels be read first? I guess we kind of just uh, answered that. But outside of the Butler and Jihad, are there any of the other prequel books that you enjoyed? No, I read the first book of the Butler and Jihad last year, and you could you could clear uh, the general rule of thumb is that 
the further away you go from Frank Herbert himself, the worse things are going to get. And I wanted to read uh, and, and sort of study the Butlerian Jihad a bit for a video and because of the sort of the overlap with robots and technology and whatnot. Um, but but I, I would read that first one. But the writing isn't going to be good and the plot lines are really clunky. Um, but but there's there's some good stuff in there, but it's it's nowhere near as good as the main canon. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think the first four books of the main canon are must reads. Five and six are you know if you really like Frank Herbert, they're they're still kind of fun even though they're way out there. And then the uh, and then the prequels, the the original trilogy of the houses, the Harkonnen, the Atreides, and and the other one, uh, pretty pretty solid. Uh, but yeah, once once you start getting into the the sons uh, prequel stuff, you you really got to enjoy it because it gets some of it gets pretty dumb. So. Uh, Templar says, but Larry and Jihad now, uh, Habib in Sahala. Yes. Thank you. And then uh, creepy reader says last one, 2049 is overrated and unworthy. I like the movie. Uh, I was surprised that I liked the movie when people told me that Blade Runner was going to have a sequel. I was like, well, that's going to be terrible. I know there are a lot of people who, who detract it, but I also know it's got a following in our spheres for a reason. I, I think it was well done. It's a, it's its own thing. It explores its own themes. Uh, it doesn't turn uh, Harrison Ford's character into sad divorced dad uh, like all the other uh, kind of sequels of that. So I, I thought it was good, though I understand if people didn't like it. I, th I think De, De Villeneuve is, is is very good with aesthetics and, and world building and a little bit weaker on character development. But in Blade Runner 2049, it kind of plays into that because it is everybody is kind of a hollowed out husk of a character. So I, I quite enjoyed it. Uh, I don't, I don't, and yeah, I understand why people in, in our scene sympathize with him as well, sadly. Um, so in a way, I like I like films that do actually touch on what's, like, what's going on in the zeitgeist. I mean, one of the things about David Lynch's Dune is that it, it really doesn't. It is just a sort of standalone pop culture fest. Uh, but, but back then, things weren't as hyper-politicized and uh, as they are now. Absolutely. All right, guys. Going to go ahead and wrap this up. Make sure that you check out all of Morgoth's excellent work. It's always a great time talking to him, and all of his work is fantastic. So you should definitely be reading and watching everything he puts out. Of course, if it's, a, if it's your first time on this channel, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure that you go ahead and click the bell notifications, all that stuff so that you can catch these streams when they go live. And if you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the Orrin McIntyre show on your favorite podcast platform. When you do leave the rating or review, it really helps with the algorithm. And if you would like to go ahead and pre-order the total state, it comes out on May 7th. You can do that on Amazon, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble, all that stuff, guys. Make sure to check that out. Thanks for coming uh, or thanks for watching. And as always, I'll talk to you next time.